Good morning, everybody. Hey, our services are gonna kick off here in just a couple minutes, but while we still have some time, we want you guys to check out the digital bulletin in which we've got some great worship songs for you guys to worship together with before the service begins. We're gonna head on out, but we'll be back in just a couple minutes. Stay tuned. We're so excited about you being a part of our worship experience. We're gonna get started in just a few minutes, but let me remind you about our life group. We are actually meeting on Wednesdays at 615 using the Zoom app. It's so easy to get connected. Just text to this number right here and we will get you connected to the life group and send out a reminder about how to get connected. church family. Services will be starting in just a few minutes, but remember, keep connecting by checking out our family newsletter that goes out each week. And remember too, if you are going to join us on campus, we have fun praise packs for all of your kids to help engage during worship service. We sure do miss you guys and can't wait to see you soon.
Hey students, I know this summer doesn't look anything like we anticipated, but we're planning to get together very soon. So stay up to date with what's going on through our student ministry newsletter and our Instagram page. See you soon.
Good morning and welcome to worship. We are so pleased that you found us, whether you're watching this broadcast on Facebook or YouTube, or maybe you're on the church website. We're so pleased that you found us because we get to worship together on Sundays. And so if we can't get together, it's great to get online. And so thank you for joining us. If you if this is the very first time that you have found us, we'd like the opportunity to connect with you. So if you wouldn't mind, just get out your cell phone and your messaging app and text the word welcome to the texting number you see below. And that would give us an opportunity to connect with you just a little bit. For the rest of us, we have something that we call a connection card. It's very easy to fill that card out and just let us know that you are participating in our service uh, today. And so we, we do invite you to uh, use that connection card. If you have a prayer request, we invite you to, to look at the web address below and just uh, give us some information of, of what you'd like for us to pray about. This will be sent out not only to the staff, but if you want it to be public, it'll go to our prayer warriors. Uh, we have a list of almost 50 people that are committed to praying over the prayer requests that come in. And so that web address has that form that you can fill out and it's very easy to do. Now at the end of a service, generally you've heard us talk about texting the word pray to our texting number. And I just wanted to explain just for a moment the difference. Uh, the prayer request form is uh, the address that you see here. But if you text the word pray to that number, that is something that at the end of a service, I need someone to pray with me like right now. And so we will get that request by text and we can communicate with you. So if you need prayer immediately after the service, that's what that is all about. Just wanted you to know about that. The other thing that is going on that is uh, really exciting is there, there are a lot of small groups that are happening during the week. And so we have many Sunday school classes that are meeting. And if your class is not meeting on a night that uh, that you're available, you know, you can join another group and to be a part of a, of a Bible study during the week. Many classes are meeting on campus in the Fellowship Hall, which is a, a wonderful venue for a class to get together. We can socially distance enough and we can have a great lesson and some prayer time and community together. So that really is exciting to be able to get together. But I want to uh, selfishly promote my life group. Janice Barber and I are meeting each Wednesday at at 6.15, and we have a group that actually meets in the fellowship hall, but we also Zoom the meeting as well. And so if you would like to be a part of the Zoom meeting, you can actually text the word life group to our texting number, and uh, that will get you on the list. And I will send out a reminder of the meeting as well as the link to join the meeting. And so th that's a great way to get connected. But if you'd like to join us at 615 in the room, you are more than welcome. We socially distance and we have the questions and we're Zooming at the same time. It really is kind of cool to be able to do that. The other thing that is going on in the life of the church, we have deacon nominations that are happening. It happens every year and uh, since this is sort of an odd time with the COVID-19 and all that's going on with that, uh, we are having the nominations going on. So there are different ways that you can submit the nominations for deacon that you might have on your heart. And so we have the paper form that you're used to seeing each year. So when you're on campus, you can actually pick up that form, fill it out and leave it, or take it home, fill it out and send it back in. You can easily do that. But you can also talk to your deacon. You can share various uh, uh, people that you feel would be good servant leaders in our congregation. You can tell your deacon and they will pass that along to deacon leadership as well as the nominating committee. But there was also an email that went out uh, just a week ago and there was a link to an online form that uh, you can actually just tell us who you are and then give us up to 12 uh, deacon nominations on that form. And so you can actually uh, look at this uh, web address below and you can go there directly to the form, submit it and nominate the deacons. Now, Ken's message today is from Proverbs chapter three and verse six. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. But before Ken brings his message, we have Mickey Donovan and Belinda Reynolds are going to bless us with some special music. Grand earth 
has quaked before Moved by the sound of his voice And seas that are shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken for my regard And through it all Far be it from me to not believe Even when my eyes can't see And this mountain that's in front of me Will be thrown into the midst of the sea Through it all, through it all, it is well.
with me. Good morning and welcome. We're so glad you're here to be a part of this online service. And Mickey and Belinda, thank you so much for leading us in that incredible song. It is well. What an incredible summary of how our lives should, should be lived out under God's direction and guidance. And if you have ever questioned our need for ongoing guidance in our lives, then the following research will certainly remove all doubt. Sheena Yingar is the professor of business and research at Columbia University's School of Business. She has found recently that the average person in their lifespan will make 1.7 million choices. In fact, she's more specific, 1,788,500 choices represent the number of choices in a person's lifespan, at least to the age of 71 or 72. This translates to 25,500 choices a year, or more significantly, this translates to 70 choices per day. Now, we're approaching the new noon hour at this very moment, and you and I have already made decisions, many more to come, in this one single day. Our choices are significant. Now, you may say some of those uh, 1.7 million choices are not that important, but when you comprise all of our choices and decisions, most certainly our lives become directed by them. It was the 20th century philosopher, Albert Camus, who said, life is the sum total of our choices. But more significantly, beloved author and pastor John Ortberg responded to this research when he wrote, when you add up all 1,788,500 choices, you come to the total sum of who you really are. Now, whether you would agree with this research or not, certainly such research raises the significance of our daily decisions. But more important, this research affirms our need to have guidance throughout the day. With every moment, we stand in need of direction. This is why the Bible counsels us to acknowledge God in all of our ways. What an incredible voice of counsel that comes to us through God's Spirit, through His Word, through Solomon as we hear these very familiar words in the context of guidance. In all your ways, acknowledge God. Acknowledge actually defines one who knows and then obeys. So acknowledge is knowing God and obeying Him. And so we have an incredible need for, for guidance and for direction in our lives. And when we acknowledge God, He, he makes our paths straight. Why is this so important? Because Proverbs 14, 12 reminds us that there is a way that seems right to man, but the end result is disappointment? No. The end result is a chance to do over? No. The end result is, according to the scripture, death. There is a way that seems right to man, but the end result is Death and destruction, man's inclination without God's involvement is always an inclination of the flesh. And the flesh, or the, the sinful, broken, fallen man, his actions will always lead to death, which is why we need Jesus and we need salvation. So of all those decisions that we make just in a single day, how dangerous it becomes when we lean on our fleshly direction as opposed to truly seeking to acknowledge God, to obey Him in all of our ways so that He can make our paths straight. I want to welcome you to our summer teaching series, Guided, wherein we're discovering seven principles for divine guidance in our life. Principle number three reminds us, guidance without ongoing obedience, guidance without acknowledgement, to use the words of Proverbs 3, 6, 
is impossible. Guidance without ongoing obedience is impossible. Now, I state that as an absolute because I believe it's an absolute. Uh, you may choose to disagree or to argue, but I believe by the end of this time of teaching, you'll, you'll be able to see along with me the truths of Scripture that truly prove how necessary it becomes to have an ongoing life of acknowledging God or an ongoing life of obedience to Him so that He can indeed direct our paths. And the spirit of obedience is so important. In the scriptures, God says uh, to obey, meaning the spirit in the heart of obedience is better than to make ceremonial sacrifices. So obedience does not reflect uh, legalism. Obedience does not re reflect a, a rigidity of, of religion. Obedience is, is our heart's response to who God is. And this certainly defines acknowledgement. So before us today with this third principle is an incredible and very familiar verse, Proverbs 3, 6, in all of your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. In response to this verse, uh, let, let's do two things. Let's make two responses. The first response, we're going to begin with the end in mind. Our first response is to focus on the goal or the, the, the result of this verse, straight paths. He will make our path straight. Uh, the second response will be two advisements that come to us from this very truth. But let's go with the first response, uh, beginning with the end in mind. Let's focus on the result, the, the, the consequence of this verse. When we acknowledge God in all of our ways, well, what's the result? He will make our paths straight. So beginning with the end in mind focuses us on the goal that God would indeed make our path straight. So we, we cut right to the prime objective of this teaching series. Divine guidance is, is not just possible or probable. It becomes a reality as we align our lives with God. The goal is straight paths that, that we would have God's direction. Uh, Roger Krowich is, is a science correspondent with Public Radio. And the Public Radio broadcast interviewed uh, th this individual back in 2010. Uh, Krowich uh, was interviewed and, and explained an incredible phenomena of our, of our human physiology. His statement was that the human, uh, the individual, uh, cannot walk in a straight line. Now, this is a, a phenomenal uh, research. Uh, uh, Krowich uh, responded to a, a research that was done decades ago, and, and German scientist uh, Jan Solman uh, championed this research, uh, proving that the humans physically cannot walk in a straight line. Uh, in fact, the, the research involved taking subjects of the research, blindfolding them, giving them a flat surface. And the research proved that, that the, the, the person walked in circles, walked circuitously, walked crooked. But when the blindfold was taken off, and the, the individual, the research subject, had the opportunity to focus on an object in front of them, they walked a completely perfect line. The, the result is this. We do not contain the, the inner orientation to walk straight. Now, that's a reference to our physiology. But isn't it amazing that God created us as a complete being? So in our physiology and in our spirituality, God created us to truly depend upon something other than our inner orientation to walk straight. I think this is a phenomenal uh, encounter with, with who we are, both physically and spiritually. We do not possess the inner orientation to walk straight. We need an object upon which we focus. And in, and in your heart, spiritually, our focus must be on, on God's way so that we are truly receiving from Him that straight path. If we rely upon ourselves or any other resource for our inner orientation, oh, we will walk crooked. Oh, may we trust God and lean toward Him and, and acknowledge Him so that our paths are straight. What does this verse actually indicate in the phrase straight paths? Well, literally, the translation is to make the path plain. Now, is that not reassuring? When we acknowledge God, again, we're looking first at the end, and the, the goal of this verse is indeed straight paths. We have a need. Uh, we can't rely upon our inner orientation spiritually. Obviously, we can't do that physically. We have a need to focus beyond our lives on, on one who will give us the straightness and the correctness. And, and I love that this, uh, 
this human term, this Hebrew terminology for our lives, straight paths, actually and literally translates a clear path. But also this phrase, straight path, references a path that that is guided around obstacles, or better, where obstacles are moved out of the way. So a plain path or even a cleared path becomes the meaning of straight. But, but also straight path can indicate the path that does not offer destruction. Isn't this reassuring? The straight path indicates one being protected from a path down which would become destruction. And so we're promised not to rely on our inner orientation spiritually. We're promised that if we acknowledge God, he gives us a straight path, a clear path, a, a path that is marked well, a path that moves uh, around obstacles or that is free of obstacles, and a path that leads to life, not to destruction. And so what an incredible promise we have to, to acknowledge God so that he will make our path straight. So that becomes the goal. He will straighten our paths. We all desperately need that God, through our faith in Jesus Christ, will guide us, straighten our paths so that we're walking according to his way. Now that's our first response to the verse, a beginning with the end in mind, straight path. But now our second response to this verse comes through two advisements. Uh, Proverbs uh, 3, 6 obviously represents a portion of the biblical literature known as the wisdom literature. Uh, but these statements throughout Proverbs aren't simply uh, wisdom statements that can be looked at from a distance and, and only observed with some uh, spirit of negotiation. Absolutely not. These, these truths from the wisdom literature are as the rest of the scripture given by God. In fact, I love how John Wesley wrote of the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs represents the dictates of the spirit in the heart of Solomon so that God could give us divine counsel. Is that not an incredible appraisal of, of the wisdom literature, the dictates of the Spirit, so that we can indeed receive divine counsel? And so that's exactly what the wisdom literature, uh, what Proverbs represents, God's divine counsel for you and for me. And, and in verse 6 alone, we find two expressions of that counsel, two advisements that we must closely adhere to so that we can indeed enjoy the straight paths God has promised. So what are these advisements? Here's the first advisement. It's built upon the first half of the verse, Proverbs 3, 6. Simply, uh, in all your ways. In all your ways represents the first advisement. I like phrasing this advisement as the, as the continual seeking of God's way. The continual leaning in and embracing God's way. So this becomes the first advisement. We are given this incredible encouragement of a continual posture of our hearts, of our, of our spiritual identity, who we are in our soul and in our, in our inner being. We need to continually seek and, and to lean toward that which God has, has given us as the direction and as the object of focus in our lives. Now, there is something to be learned from the expanded context of, of Proverbs chapter 3. In chapter 2, we are, uh, we are given a warning to the young concerning ruinous companionships. It's a very clear warning spelled out in the previous chapter. I find that interesting because in contrast to that uh, ruinous companionship of the world, chapter 3 reminds us of the importance of prioritizing our proper standing with God, certainly and with others. So, so now from the expanded context of Proverbs 3, look at the context represented inside of Proverbs chapter 3. This chapter shows the heart of one who is truly desiring to constantly live in a right standing with God and with others in a proper relationship with God and with man as summarized in verse 4. And so we are told in the context of, of Proverbs and in the context of the third chapter the significance of, of being in that proper standing with God. But this proper standing with God is more than just desiring 
direction so that we might uh, follow in, in somewhat of a legal pattern. There is something much deeper here. The statement before verse 6, uh, more often quoted together than apart, states, uh, trust God with all of your heart. So verse 5, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on what you think you know on your own understandings, but in all your ways acknowledge him. The, the phrase, trust God with all of your heart, oh, represents a, a phenomenal truth for, for verse 6. We can't really grasp verse 6 without the, the tutelage and the leadership of verse 5. Trusting in God with all of our hearts allows us to see the spirit of what it truly means to acknowledge in, in, in all of our ways represents this continual seeking God that, that is done not just with mind and with uh, uh, surface disciplines, but done with the heart. Uh, biblical scholars Kyle and Dalek interpret that phrase with all of your heart to indicate that when one leans upon God relationally and personally with all of their being, they find a place to rest and a place from which they receive guidance and strength. And so the emphasis of continually seeking God actually displays a heart that is more interested in being after God than being after some revelation of a truth. In other words, may it be that we're desiring God more than we're desiring his guidance. This becomes expressed when we read, trust God with all of your heart, and not your own understanding, because in all of your ways, we should be seeking God and, and desiring that right position with our Heavenly Father. So, so yes, the, the first advisement is to continually seek in all of your ways reflects this continual ongoing lifestyle of, of our ultimate concern of being in the right standing with God, and this is to be done with the heart in, in all of our ways, with all of our being. What does this look like? Can I share with you three examples of what life looks like when we are we're in this first advisement of continually seeking? Well, one example can be found in Psalm 105, verse 4, which says, Seek God's face continually. In the Hebrew, face represents presence. And so uh, we, we must seek God's presence. Our desire must be to continually abide in the presence of God. This is an incredible statement. So our, our first response is to continually seek in all of your ways. What does that look like? Well, first, this can be expressed in our desire to continually reside in God's presence. So if we are seeking God's word for a revelation, if we are seeking the knowledge of God's scripture, if we are trying to discipline our lives to, to spend time in prayer each day, may it be that, that our uh, attending to spiritual duties is not the objective. The objective is all to be in God's presence. This word seek in Psalm 105 verse 4 actually represents seeking in order to find an answer. And so we, we seek God's face because we know therein lies our help and our resource and our strength and, and our, our provisions. Oh, what a beautiful picture it becomes. And what a great expression of continually seeking God that we would desire to be in his presence always. Oh, there's a second example that comes from a verse I think you'll find very familiar. We move to the New Testament. And a second example to this advisement of continually seeking God comes from, and you might guess, Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Well, what does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God? Uh, well, we, we've understood this meaning uh, for years. What a, what a blessed scripture we have. What, a, what an incredible truth our Lord taught in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. Seek first his kingdom, which actually indicates responding to his kingdom work in our lives, meaning his salvation and his restoration of that which is broken. Oh, he's come to establish his kingdom, and he, he establishes that in part. And in our lives, Jesus pointed to his disciples and said, the kingdom is within you. God has come through Christ to restore what is broken in us. And so to seek his kingdom is to live 
in response to his work of salvation in us as it involves how we follow him. And so what does it look like to continually seek? Well, as, as Psalms taught us, we, we continually seek by desiring his presence always, by desiring to be in his presence. But secondly, continually seeking indicates that we are constantly seeking first his kingdom, meaning that we are constantly responding to his kingdom work in us, his work of salvation in us. He's the captain, he's the author of our salvation, Hebrews teaches. So we respond to our salvation and to his work in and around us concerning his kingdom, how his rule and reign will, will bring to, together and fulfill all that has been broken by sin. And so when we live in response to that through how we follow and obey the words of Christ, then we are truly seeking his kingdom. Well, there's a third example that I'd like to share with you concerning what it means to continually seek God. This is our first advisement from Proverbs 3, 6, to, to in all of our ways to acknowledge him, to, to continually seek him, uh, can, be, uh, can be better understood through the example of Isaiah 55, verse 6. That verse simply says, Seek him while he may be found. This is, an, again, an incredible statement, familiar to many of us. Seek him while he may be found. The word seek there is completely different from any other Hebrew uh, word for seek that we've quoted thus far. In, in that verse, which is why I believe God's Spirit led me to that verse, in Isaiah 55, 6, the word seek actually indicates not seeking something to find an answer, but actually seeking in a way of examining in a continual way. Well, in the Hebrew context, the, the point of reference would go to the ceremony of temple worship or that which is done regularly over and over again in an observance of God's very nature. So what a phenomenal statement this is that we would seek continually by constantly coming before God and, and seeing him for who he is. We might even translate that as true worship. So what does it look like to continually seek? Desire his presence always, prioritize his work of salvation in us, and then third, constantly be in his presence for the purpose of worship. This becomes how we continually seek him. And when we are continually acknowledging him in this way, he makes our paths straight. Now, this is such an incredible promise. Uh, when we follow him and we're looking at him step by step, he directs our paths. Uh, Anne Graham Lotz, the, uh, the daughter of uh, the, the late and great evangelist Billy Graham, told the story of she and her husband Denny, who attended many football games at Denny's alma mater, the University of North Carolina. And she would say that, uh, that just before a, a football game, as she t tells her story, uh, there are thousands in the parking lot. And because her husband is of the stature six foot seven inches, and because her stature doesn't allow her to see over the crowd, she simply holds his hands and follows him, knowing that as she just follows him step by step, she goes right where she needs to go because he can see over the crowd. And then she writes this, she takes the very same procedure with her Lord. And she says, she writes, I hold on to his hand and I simply look at him step by step and follow without concern with the crowd. And then she concludes with this. I pray that 10 years from now, I can look back or 20 years from now, I can look back and realize that I simply followed him step by step in obedience to his call on my life to follow him. Oh, what an incredible measure of continually seeking this is. And, and that is why those examples posture us for looking at at God and looking at Christ and following him intently so that indeed holding his hand we're focusing on step by step and he guides our way. So the first advisement is in all of your ways which translates continually seek God. Now the second advisement comes from a little deeper understanding of the verse uh, from the second phrase. The first phrase in all of your ways. The second phrase acknowledge him. So the second advisement from this holy divine counsel from this wisdom is to truly acknowledge or to state this way, may your seeking after God always be expressed as acknowledgement. Uh, acknowledgement's a strong word. It's, it seems maybe perhaps uh, not that impactful in our language, but oh, what a, what a powerful word. So, so let me share with you three uh, expressions of acknowledgement. First, acknowledgement uh, e expresses 
the, the desire, acknowledgement expresses this incredible desire for careful thought about God. Acknowledgement is expressing careful thought of God. The word acknowledge comes from the Hebrew word yodal, which actually means to know. And in the Old Testament, this idea of knowing referenced knowing at the level of understanding. This uh, word was used a lot when, when God prescribed, hey, I want you to know that which is good and that which is evil, a knowledge that differentiates, a knowledge that truly understands. And here, acknowledgement references the yodal, the, the knowing, the careful attention of who God is. This is a beautiful picture of, of, of knowing God and, and referencing him. And so how do we acknowledge? What does acknowledgement look like? giving careful thought, careful and intimate thought to the nature of God and, and his full nature is revealed in Christ. So one could also say a careful thought of Christ. The phrase is ham hanek met. In Paraguay, there was uh, an, an, a native Indian, a Maka Indian who made his way to the front porch of a missionary. Well, the missionary is inside of his home and enjoying a meal, and he looks up and he sees the long silhouette of this individual on his porch. So he steps out to find this Maka India by the name of Raphael. And so the missionary looks at him and says, hey, how can I help you? And the, in, the Indian said, Ham Hanek Met, which in the translation of, 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 of his tribal language actually means, I am not here for me, I am here for presence. And what he meant was this, I am here to simply show my presence for you. Because in that culture, presence was the ultimate way to give respect to someone that you love and honor. I am not here for me. I am here to show my presence with you. What an incredible statement reflected in this idea of acknowledgement. Acknowledging God by giving careful thought of God and careful thought of being in his presence. Acknowledgement also indicates, not just careful thought, but, but knowledge indicates surrender. The very word means submission or surrender to God, but not just surrender as in acquiescing or, or giving up. Sometimes we see surrender uh, limited to just giving up or giving in. But here, acknowledgement references surrender by way of serving. I've coined a phrase in my own study, uh, called a uh, temple tendency. Now, what is temple tendency? I reflect on Isaiah 6, where Isaiah is in God's presence. And he, he gives that careful thought of God. And his, his initial reaction is, God, I'm sinful. And then God, God touches his lip with that coal. And then, and then uh, his, his next response is, I'm here. I'm ready to serve. Therein lies the beautiful and perfect definition of surrender, captured in this term, acknowledgement. Surrendering to serve. Not simply giving up or saying, well, God, if, if it's your way, then I guess I'll have to lay my way aside. No, that's not the spirit of acknowledgement. Acknowledgement means because of who God is, I willingly lay all of my resources down and I say, God, I'm yours. I'm here and I serve as you desire. Well, that's a perfect picture of, of acknowledgement. Careful thought to his presence and then surrender. But a final expression of acknowledgement is is a reflection of discipleship. Acknowledgement reflects discipleship. For the very core of discipleship is when we, in all of our ways, acknowledge God by living life in the name of Christ. So acknowledgement reflects discipleship and that we acknowledge God by doing all things in the name of Christ. A, a partnering verse from the New Testament is Colossians 1, uh, excuse me, Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of Christ. Well, to do something in the name of Christ doesn't mean that we simply quote Christ's name while we're serving, but actually that we would see ourselves as serving on behalf of Christ, not simply in agreement with Christ, but on his behalf, as if he is serving through us and loving and living through us. So the core of discipleship is how can I exhibit and demonstrate Christ to others? How can I do this in the name 
of Christ. You see, Matthew 7, 7 gives us that promise. Seek and you'll find, knock and it will be open, ask and, and it will be given. But the foundation of that can be found in John 14, 13 when we read, if you ask anything in my name, Jesus said, the Father will do it. In my name references one who says, I, I am serving, I'm asking, I'm teaching, I'm living, I'm loving, I'm raising my children, I'm, I'm attending to my affairs and my career, I'm following uh, all of the obligations I have in life as if it were Christ himself, for I serve on his behalf so that his love and his life has become evident. So this is, a, again, a, an incredible picture of discipleship, this idea of acknowledgement, because the core of discipleship is I am honoring Jesus in every part of my life. And so that becomes the clear demonstration of, of acknowledgement. So we are given two advisements concerning uh, how we are, are seeking God in all of our ways. Uh, the first advisement is, is to do continually, to seek continually. And the second advisement is that we must allow our seeking to truly be acknowledgement, to say, God, in, in everything, I, I respond to you. And I desire your will and your purpose to be done. So, oh, this incredible picture of, of acknowledgement references careful thought to who God is, references that we're, we're seeking God in, in every way and that our, our ultimate expression is in our discipleship that we do all things for the glory of God. It was the church father of the second century, Irenaeus, who said the glory of God is man fully alive. And what Irenaeus was saying is when we are fully alive in God's spirit, living for Christ, that's when God himself receives ultimate glory. So, yes, guidance without obedience is impossible. And obedience is not a legal response to a list of commands. Obedience is your heart aligning with God and all things seeking him and seeking by way of acknowledging Him, through, through honoring Him and allowing your life to be completely aligned with, with that which brings Him glory. So I pray that you will respond to obedience concerning your relationship with Christ, your relationship with God, so that indeed, as He promised, He will make your path straight. Don't forget, that's where we begin. The ultimate objective is Him guiding you, and that comes from our ongoing relational obedience expressed here as acknowledgement. When you acknowledge him in all of your ways, he'll direct your paths. I pray this is a strong reality in your life. And I want to pray with you now. And perhaps you're here today and you're, you're struggling in your faith. I pray that you'll feel God strengthening you to walk in obedience, heart obedience, acknowledging him. But maybe you're, you're here this morning and you're at your your dining room table and you're in, on your sofa, wherever you may be, and, and you're leaning in. And, and maybe this, this divine direction we so desperately need because we're constantly making choices, maybe, maybe this has caused you to realize you've never placed your faith in Jesus. And it begins with the relationship. And scripture says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved from our sin. So I ask you now, would you trust Jesus? You can pray a prayer just like this. Jesus, I believe that you're God's son, that you died on the cross and you rose again for me. I repent of my sin. I confess you as Savior and Lord, and I give my life to you. You can pray that now, and, and, and I believe God will hear you because you're praying according to his truth. And if you've prayed that prayer, we really want to encourage you. There's a texting number on the screen, and if you text that number, uh, there'll be someone that will, will just simply give you some gentle instruction. We'll be glad to reach out to you. There's also a, a website address that, that you can uh, log into to find out what you can do as you place your faith in Christ and then move forward. But wherever you may be in your heart right now concerning a relationship with God, trust Him. Receive Jesus as your Savior. And if you've done so, rely upon His divine guidance. Acknowledge Him in every way in your life. He truly desires to guide you. You can live guided if we place and put our complete trust in Jesus Christ. I'd love to pray with you. Father, thank you for teaching us through your word. And now, Father, as we move beyond this teaching, the teaching was not just the goal of this moment. The teaching was the inspiration that you've given us to move to a life of response to you. Help us to respond to you now, Father God, in our heart, in faith, 
so that we're living for you, so that we have that divine guidance in our lives that we so desperately need. Thank you for instructing us. Be with those who are making decisions. Be with all of us as we continue to learn how to follow you carefully in our obedience, because if we truly want divine guidance, our hearts need to be in a spirit of obedience to you so that we're aligned with you as you desire. Thank you, God, for reaching out to us today. And we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. And together we said, amen. God bless you. There are some announcements that are coming up on the screen in just a second. So glad you're here with us. Love you a lot. See you soon. God bless. Our King's Grant Farmer's Market is this Thursday from 4 to 7. So bring the family, come get some really good food, and love your city. See you then. I wanted to take a moment just to remind you of the benevolent offering for the month of June. We are partnering with Cape Charles Baptist Church and a lot of ministry that's happening on the Eastern Shore. And so when you give toward that benevolent offering, you are helping migrant workers, you're helping the Adoptal Block Ministry, and you're helping Cape Charles Baptist Church minister in their community. And so all the funds collected through that benevolent offering will go toward helping those on the Eastern Shore. Students, the long wait is over. We're finally getting back together this Wednesday. Make sure you check out the Instagram page and the student ministry newsletter so that you know when to be here and what's going on. See you this Wednesday. Hey everybody, this summer, KGBC is so excited to present Concrete and Cranes, VBS at home. Each day, your kids will enjoy opening rally antics, music, movements, and amazing Bible stories, all from the comfort of your own home. So kids, you'll also get to see some familiar faces, including our beloved Jelly and Bandit. Hey guys! <laughs> so families, register by July 19th to receive your special VBS toolbox complete with everything you need for an amazing week. So grab your hard hats and your safety vests. It's time to register for VBS.